guess we have time for a, a few questions here. Uh, first one, it looks like, uh, Roger, this might be uh, directed at you. Uh, with aviation fuel efficiency improving so much faster than automobile fuel efficiency, isn't it a good thing that people are flying more? Uh, yes, in, in, uh, in, in some cases I think you can make a, a strong case that uh, certain trips, uh, given the capacity factor of, of, the, uh, of the airplanes, uh, it is more uh, fuel efficient to fly rather than certainly to drive, especially if the competition is a single person dri driving a, uh, uh, an individual uh, vehicle. Uh, uh, and aviation fuel efficiency has been increasing dramatically over the past several decades and um, is forecast to, to increase further in the future. And as I indicated briefly, that there are a number of actions uh, such as better uh, uh, air traffic control, more efficient uh, routing, uh, that can further increase that, and, and uh, as an example, the uh, Boeing 787 is supposed to be about 20 percent more fuel efficient than uh, than, than the uh, the competition is one of the reasons it's 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 uh, selling well. Uh, so there, there are, are are many advantages to flying. The, of course, the, the major one being um, it, it is so uh, so very time efficient. It's one thing to talk about about taking a, a, a train from Washington D.C. to Chicago. Uh, you, uh, airplane, you can get there an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, you know, if you value your time, air travel is the way to go, and that's why it's been such a growth industry forever and is, is uh, forecast uh, to increase uh, so rapidly. But again, when the crunch comes and when peak oil occurs and begins to impact dramatically GDP, business revenues, and disposable income, there's an awful lot of people that won't be able to fly, and an awful lot of more people that will be flying a, a lot less. And Unfortunately, f from the aviation sector's perspective, there's not too much directly that it can do itself to, uh, to alleviate that. It can make itself more efficient, pack more people on planes, but if people aren't flying, if, they don't, if, they, if, they, if people don't have jobs and don't have uh, money to pay their mortgage, their rent, buy food, their utilities, they're not going to be uh, flying. So I, I think the, uh, the, the situation for the aviation sector is potentially very, very grim. Let's move to... Uh Electric transportation, uh, Alan. Okay. Um, how interested are USA Railways in electrification? Uh, the answer is today not much because it's evolved into a duopoly. And if people know economics, there's no incentive for uh, innovation in a duopoly where you only have one. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. How interested are USA Railroads in electrification? In the 1970s, uh, there were a series of studies made by over almost a dozen different railways on electrification of different routes, and an eyeball guess would be that it was about 6,000 miles that they looked at electrifying. Uh, today, however, the industry has evolved into basically duopoly, only two competing railroads in most of the country. And for people that are aware of economics, there's no incentive for improvement or innovation when you're dealing with a duopoly. Uh, the economics are quite strong. The Trans-Siberian Railway, which goes from, Pacific, from Moscow to the Pacific Ocean, was electrified in 2002. So there are no technical opposition. Good. Justin, what about that recycling of that battery, and what about diesel hybrids? Yeah, you saw I had those off to the side already. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, w w there's a lot of questions about diesels and, and diesel hybrids. Do they make sense and whatnot? Um, uh, the thing to understand about, uh, well, first is to talk about clean diesels in general. Uh, uh, there's a question here, why, you know, why don't we have clean diesels? We actually do have clean diesel programs in Europe. I don't know if most of you are aware of that. We have a joint project with Shell where we're doing uh, clean diesel projects. Um, but when you start looking at diesel emissions totally, what you're going to find is that uh, with very, very advanced exhaust after treatment, you can start to meet uh, California emission requirements, which are not just California anymore. Maybe everyone knows that already. And um, uh, Andreas Trockebaugh from Mercedes, uh, he was quoted earlier this year as saying, in order to meet uh, California air quality requirements on emissions for diesel cars, they have to add thousands of dollars of exhaust after treatment. So when you start considering the thousands of dollars in exhaust after treatment, you start looking at a hybrid, all of a sudden, you know, the hybrids still look pretty good. Um, when it comes to a diesel hybrid, things have to line up. Uh, again, if you're going to be adding the thousands of dollars in after treatment to get it clean, 
uh, and you're going to be adding a hybrid technology, which is going to increase the cost, you're going to start getting that vehicle into a position where it's not suitable for the market. And so the balance point isn't there yet. Uh, and that's kind of the, the big summary on those two items. Roger, a couple of questions to you. Yeah, the first question here is, uh, won't declining GDP and rising bond defaults have very negative impact on the financial system? Uh, the answer is an emphatic uh, yes. As I briefly mentioned, uh, as the aviation sector uh, turns from a rapidly growing one to a flat or declining uh, sector, all, so many of the, these, uh, these financing options, these, these bonds and that that have been floated, 20, 30 year bonds to pay for um, airport infrastructure, airport expansion, airport industrial parks, not to mention the airplanes and everything uh, concerned, uh, a lot of them in invariably will, will go into uh, default. So even, even people who say, well, I don't travel that much and I ride mass transit or I drive electric cars, so peak oil doesn't, uh, really gonna, is not really going to impact me that directly. Uh, if those bonds are held by your pension fund, your college savings plan, uh, whatever, you will indeed be, uh, be impacted. Uh, but again, th this is just an indication of, of how all this is going to cascade through the financial sector as, as peak oil occurs and it impacts GDP. For example, um, long distance truckers will be ban abandoning their rigs. They're mostly independent contractors with huge mortgage on them. Hundreds of thousands of those will be defaulted to the banks. People living in the, the outer suburbs without access to mass transit, far from their jobs, they lose their jobs, they can't afford to travel, they'll abandon uh, their houses. You're seeing it already in the subprime market. What's happening in the subprime market today could just be a, a minor precursor of what's going to happen under peak oil as things cascade throughout the financial system in ways we don't know, but we can, we, we, I think we should be very concerned about. Good, good. Uh, Justin, a new model uh, uh, that's been introduced is a, a car company called Tesla, thinking they can market an electric car with uh, uh, 6,000 uh, C-sized batteries. Uh, what about that, and what about new, new startups like that? Uh, are, are, uh, what's, uh, what's your philosophy on uh, startups like that, and then what are the challenges in that, uh, in that whole arena with battery technology? You know, it, uh, Startups like that are exciting for everybody, uh, not, not just um, you guys out there, but for us as automakers too, to see them kind of push, push ideas and push technologies and whatnot. But the thing that we look at when we look at items like that is, is it really something that's going to be suitable that can really be made for the mass market? Uh, using a whole bunch of C-sized batteries is great and all, uh, but when you start looking at uh, the thermal management of those packs, you start looking at the real life of those packs, the warranty cost of those packs, the recycling of those packs. There's a lot bigger issues that companies like Tesla, they just can't handle right now because of their size. They're relatively small. But it's exciting for them to see them push the technology forward. They have a lot of good stuff going on with their power electronics. Um, a lot of people don't look at that. They tend to focus on their battery issues, but their power electronics is probably the better part of their programs. When it comes to um, battery technologies, we get a lot of discussions about battery technologies. You know, What's going on with lithium? Why doesn't the Prius have lithium in it yet? And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. And is Toyota forgetting about lithium? Absolutely not. Since we formed our joint relationship in the early 90s with Panasonic uh, to do nickel metal packs, that scope of work included lithium. And we've been working on lithium, and our lithium packs we feel are as good as our competition and as good as the press releases you read. But guess what? We don't think it's good enough for you. And we're going to make it better, and we're going to get it to a point where it makes sense for you, and then that's when we'll put them out in the market. Good. Okay, Alan, how much oil could be saved if we uh, kind of uh, swapped one for another? If highway freight could be carried by electrified railroads, what, what uh, barrel uh, savings would we see? Um, the statistics I found were for 2003, and inner city heavy trucks used 2.2 million barrels per day, and that's from memory, and railroads used a little bit over a quarter million. So the upper bound on savings would be two and a half million barrels per day if we shifted from 18-wheel trucks to electrified railways with auxiliary savings in uh, fewer people killed, uh, less highway maintenance, less need for highway expansion, and so forth. I don't know how many of you know Bill McDonough. He's a, uh, a, a pretty interesting architect who has uh, really done a lot of green building. He's uh, rebuilt, uh, helped Ford rebuild the Rouge plant. 
uh, as a total system and sustainability approach. He's been recently taxed with the, uh, with the challenge of building uh, six new cities in China uh, to, to house uh, 800 million people. Now, if you think about the uh, challenge, if you were the project manager in charge of, of building a city uh, for 800 million people, uh, what kind of transportation system and what kind of energy flows would you choose to make that sustainable? Uh, Roger, I ask you, what, uh, what are your thoughts on, on new mo models for going forward for, for growth instead of uh, perhaps sprawling alternatives that we're seeing, uh, uh, as Peter pointed out this morning, in China? Well, I, I think the new models uh, are absolutely necessary and they will be thrust upon us uh, one way or the other, whether we plan for it or not, sooner or, or later and probably uh, sooner. As we've seen the past two days, we, being the United States, the OECD, Australia, whoever you, you, you wish, cannot continue on the same growth uh, pattern uh, development that we, we have had for the past 40 or 50 or 60 years. I mean, today, where I come from, the Washington, D.C. metro area, there are people who commute every day into, into the D.C. metropolitan area from southern Pennsylvania and from West Virginia. That kind of st stuff has got to stop and, and be reversed. Perhaps in, in China, the, 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 they have a great opportunity to prevent that from happening to begin with. We in this country, unfortunately, and, and many other countries, some other countries around the world, Australia again comes to mind, we have a, a very severe problem because we've developed this way over the past 50 or 60 years and you just can't say we're going to uh, forget about several trillion dollars of infrastructure because it's too far from the central city, it's energy inefficient, it doesn't have uh, access to uh, mass transit, uh, what have you. Uh, extreme commuters, people that live far from their jobs, uh, the, 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 the shopping malls spread all, 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 over the, um, uh, all over the countryside. Yeah, a lot of those will, will default and, and the, it, it, it will impact the cascade throughout uh, the financial system, but we just can't put, we can't afford to abandon several trillion dollars in infra infrastructure. Um, so yes, new models will be required. The, the, they'll be forced upon us one way or the other. Uh, the Chinese and Indians may be in a much better position to deal with this because they're building their infrastructure. We've got it uh, built. Uh, ours is predicated, of course, on, on endless supplies of very cheap petroleum, which may indeed be coming to an end very quickly. Right. And, and Alan, I turn to you on, uh, on that same subject. In Denver, where I come from, the uh, uh, population just voted in a, a, a tax increase for light rail and R RTD. And uh, when the uh, project was done, they found that at the nodes of the rail stops, uh, all of a sudden there are economic mini booms in the new urbanism for uh, people don't want to get stuck in traffic. They want to live around these nodes. Can you comment on that? Yes. Um, there was a, a series of polls that have been done that. And if you look at the totality of the polls, you could say that a quarter to a third of Americans want to live in transit-oriented development today but less than 2% do because there's not enough T to do the oriented development around. And it, what little TOD there is sells at an enormous premium. But if we expand the number of T nodes, then the price premium and the number of people that can move in it. I just wanna meet, if we can meet this existing demand, I think the demand will grow over time. But if we can just move a quarter of Americans into TOD, this would be a major step forward in our oil dependency. Justin, the, uh, a lot of hype, as you, as you noted, uh, about plug-in hybrids. Uh, it has great opportunities. Uh, it has been suggested to me that uh, perhaps the new model for the auto companies be that they will become a supplier. Instead of acting like gods, uh, demanding and pressing their suppliers, uh, they might be the supplier to the building industry, namely, uh, the question rises because that $10,000 battery pack of, of lithium that we're talking about, uh, how in the world are you going to make the business case for that battery uh, cost? And then uh, if you were a, a supplier to, for example, the builder and say, I'm going to supply you with five new cars in your 30-year mortgage uh, of that new house you're buying, perhaps you can disguise or hide the cost of that battery in the long-term mortgage uh, as an extra 15 bucks because people snap their fingers and buy that granite countertop upgrade 
which is also about 10 grand. So what about that, uh, coupling the house and the car as a, as a say a point of sale, and then that would be also a way to load level your production for future uh, capacity. Yeah, th those type of discussions are uh, actually very interesting, and, and they do offer kind of a possible bridge to get the technology out a little bit on, uh, a little bit quicker. Uh, but the, the key hurdle that we still have is the battery itself. And, uh, and until we have a battery that's ready to be out there, that's ready to, to fit in the market, and we can find a size that really fits with the American population as well as the world population, uh, until we can identify that, it's a little bit premature to start trying to figure out what's the best way to knock the price down. Um, it kind of leads me to uh, about the smart grids, because I don't know if you guys talk much about smart grids, and there's a lot of talk about providing uh, the energy from your, your car to the grid. And, um, you know, that's kind of an exciting thing in theory. Uh, and then uh, I talked to some energy companies, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll prorate it, we'll give you some money. And so, uh, you know, that's, that seems interesting from a bottom line standpoint. But uh, as a consumer, would you be acceptable to go in your car, jump in it, and find out that your battery is dead, and then you think, oh, well, at least I made some money. So you look at your, your power meter and you realize you made $8 or $4. Does that really make sense or not either? So when we look at these alternative ways to kind of uh, knock the cost down on the batteries, we've we got to try to make sure it's feasible. It, and that you guys, the, the people that are going to be using that technology, is going to accept that price or that cost. We, uh, at NREL, we've worked quite a bit about uh, on battery technology. We do think it is the key enabler for a technology such as plug-ins if it, if it is to be commercialized. And one of the issues about batteries in particular is how you cycle the ba battery, how that battery is used, and just as Justin is talking about on a V2G, vehicle to grid, a smart grid, smart appliance, if the battery energy is sucked way down, some batteries cannot tolerate that state of charge swing. And in fact, you can wear out a battery very quickly if you let that state of charge swing go very, very high. In fact, the uh, battery uh, in, in most hybrids today only use about a quarter of the capacity of the battery. They swing from about maybe 80% state of charge to 50% state of charge. And that's where they want to keep it in that, uh, in that, in that temperate uh, state of charge swing. You can sing, if you look at uh, psych, battery cycle data, you can uh, bring the battery down just a little bit, 10% state of charge, bring it back up, not overcharge it, millions and millions of times without a degradation in capacity. But as you swing at deep ch cycle charges uh, with certain battery chemistries, uh, that's an issue. Uh, so I if I counter uh, Justin's point here for a second, uh, if we have millions and millions of batteries out there and the utility uses these appliances in a smart grid and they say, okay, much like uh, every car has an IP address, like a, a computer has an IP address, let's have 10, 10 million cars all of a sudden uh, uh, as, as distributed power sources add to my capacity because of my peak load at 10 o'clock as I'm growing in air conditioning load, that might be very practical. Uh, if, in fact, the control strategy on the car isn't going to let you because the battery, uh, the car company is probably going to be controlled for the, uh, for the warranty. You don't want to have the utility uh, ruin your battery and then you have to pick up the warranty. Now, now so far in this, co in this conference, I've talked kind of negatively, I guess it may, may sound from everyone, about plug-in technology. But the reality is plug-in technology is a feasible technology. We're just not there yet. And unlike uh, what you may have heard in the media, I just wanted to make sure that we gave you an honest assessment. We didn't want to come here and blow a bunch of smoke for you guys. What we wanted to do was tell you the truth so that you knew what the, the real status of the technology is. Okay, as... It's a sociological change that needs to happen, you're right. And it takes all of us. It takes all of us. And it starts with little steps. And it starts with educating our young. And it starts with educating uh, our friends and our families. About what? About being car dependent or about using more using, technology to be car dependent? Using energy wisely. That's what it's about. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I guess I was trying to, uh, to get at in these new system paradigms of how we have the inner city and new urbanism modes and the challenge that McDonough has. How we build out that new model and how we bicycle and walk to work and, and we've been talking to some industries. They're having problems because people don't want to drive uh, two hours. On, on the future is not going to be about what people want. It's going to yeah. be about what the future requires them to do. Right. 
it's going to be about what's sustainable. Okay. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. Uh, I'll end the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I'll, I'll give you the last word here. Get out of this trouble. <laughs> I appreciate Jim's comments. Um, I don't happen to disagree. Uh, I agree. Um, at the same time, um, people will still be buying cars next year and the year after and the year after. Um, how we get from here to there, nobody has a wonderful blueprint. Um, it's going to take a lot of input from folks in the, well, Terry. Yeah, hey, hey, Terry, it, it's true. <laughs> or an Allen, sure, and the and the rail, but it but everyone isn't going to jump on rail. If I if you live in Westcliff, Colorado, uh, you're never going to get rail service. We had it for four years in the 1890s. Uh, once the gold ran out, the rail was torn up. Um, so th th it isn't going to it isn't there is no silver bullet on the demand side either. Um, we heard a lot about the supply side yesterday. Uh, we're started off with Peter Terzakian and, and highlighting the enormous crunch coming on, on the demand side from the other side of the world. We heard a little bit about that from Matt Simmons yesterday. Um, it's a fixed pie to some degree. Uh, the geologists we heard will not agree as to how large the pie is, but for practical purposes, a fixed size, fixed pie, and the sizes of the slices appear to be um, headed for shrinkage uh, at the very same time that we have more people who want to slice. So um, there are no easy answers. Uh, I think all sectors need to come to the table. Um, if I had to look at the paradigm of uh, the, the business model of GM versus the business model of Toyota, at least as early as 1992, Toyota understood peak oil. Uh, if you're going to supply a product to the market, uh, I appreciate the fact that they're headed in the direction that, that uh, Washington, D.C. should have encouraged long ago, but has failed badly to do. Um, all of us in the room need to encourage uh, the split between what I call sort of the, the uh, potentially mutual suicide pact between um, D.C. and Detroit. <laughs> and Toyota is, is leading away. I remember back, and I think many of you do too, uh, back in 1970-71 when there were a lot of testimony about cleaning up the air in, in Washington and Detroit was saying, we can't do this, we can't do this. And about six months later, quietly, Toyota and Honda and a few other players came into the room and said, well, here's the catalytic converter uh, that will do just that. And I went, oh, <clears throat> we need more of that kind of... Uh, action and I applaud that. Uh, I, I, at the same time, that doesn't deal with the long-term needs that we have. Alan is talking about something that will help uh, address those long-term needs. In the urban setting, it's a lot tougher in a lot of other places. But I really appreciate that, uh, that uh, uh, vision that, that you shared with us of both the past and the future. Uh, we're going to take a break now.